Bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's a Green Party of Canada press conference this morning to focus on an area that I, I don't think other, other parties are adequately addressing, and it's cross-cutting. Cross-cutting issues are hard uh, because we tend to focus on one thing at a time. But when you see a pattern, you want to identify it and identify it as a problem. So my name is Elizabeth May. I'm the parliamentary leader of the Green Party of Canada, member for Saanich Gulf Islands. I'm joined by Paul Manley, member for Nanaimo Ladysmith, and Jenica Atwin from Fredericton. So what we want to focus on this morning is a deep systemic problem of regulatory capture. I'm going to make a bold statement, and we're prepared to defend it, that virtually every regulator in this country is more concerned with the progress, well-being of the industry they regulate than with the Canadian public interest. This is a deep problem. The SNC-Lavalin scandal drew some attention, much needed attention, on the power of corporate influence over government decision making. But SNC-Lavalin is not alone in having excessive influence over the decisions made in government. Now sometimes the decisions made and the, the, the regulator has in law a requirement to consider promoting the industry they regulate. That's quite wrong. It's quite disturbing. Certainly Department of Fisheries and Oceans has historically had a requirement to promote aquaculture while they also regulate it. This may be changing now because we know there will be a new Aquaculture Act. But the offshore petroleum boards, the Canada-Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board, the Canada-Newfoundland-Labrador Offshore Petroleum Board, has requirements to promote offshore oil and gas while regulating and also continuing to do environmental assessments of it. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency has a requirement to promote Canadian food agribusiness and exports while also regulating for food safety. Uh, certainly, Big Pharma has enormous influence. And I men we mentioned in the press release that we would have had Pharmacare years ago if not for the influence of Big Pharma. But one thing that hasn't received enough attention is that even after the, Gov the Parliament of Canada in the 41st session of Parliament passed Vanessa's law to bring in new transparency around pharmaceuticals, to require that side effects be reported, to require that drug trials be made public, even though the will of Parliament was clear, Within Health Canada, uh, at the level of, of civil servants, uh, there, were, there was a guidance document prepared that essentially perverted where Vanessa's Act was supposed to take us in terms of sharing drug trials. Uh, that's the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to share at this point, uh, je veux partager le temps et passer la parole à Paul Manley, parce que nous avons ici plusieurs d'industries uh, avec trop d'influence sur les décisions gouvernementales. So I'll turn to Paul and then to Jenica. Thank you. So I have an example from my writing of a young man who was a graduate of VIU who was on the Ethiopian uh, Max, uh, Boeing Max flight. And his family has asked that, uh, that we, we ha follow our own regulation path in Canada rather than, than hopping on board with uh, the Federal Aviation Authority in the United States, which, which is what happened with the, the downing of the, the Ethiopian jet and the, uh, the jet in Indonesia as well. We waited because we we're tied very closely with um, American industries through regulatory co cooperation. Uh, and I'm concerned with uh, the way that regulatory cooperation might uh, unroll with NAFTA. We've seen in the Security Prosperity Partnership uh, agreement when we were talking about harmonization of regulations, there was 20 corporations from each country that were meeting to determine the regulations between the three, the three uh, NAFTA partners. And in Canada, we had some great Canadian corporations like Walmart Canada, Home Depot Canada, Ford Canada, uh, Chevron Canada, determining what those regulations would be and how they were harmonized. So we want to be able to make sure that Canadians follow their own path that uh, we um, don't just follow the, the corporations and, and do the branch plant thing. We're also very concerned about uh, lobbying, and I'm going to pass it over to uh, Jenica Atwin to talk about that. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, so, I mean, it should be no surprise that a critical flaw in our system is the power extended to lobbyists. 
Um, last June, as an example, the Narwhal investigation revealed that 80% of Senate lobbying for Bill C-69, um, new environmental assessment legislation, was done by oil and gas lobbyists. Across government, industry, and associated groups uh, registered to lobby on Bill C-69 held 945 meetings with elected officials. Only 58 meetings were held by environmental groups and seven by indigenous groups. This imbalance paints a clear picture. We have rich, powerful corporations exerting, exerting undue influence on legislation in this country because they're able to pay for access to decision makers. Certaines entreprises ont acquis le pouvoir d'influencer le processus législatif en leur faveur en raison de l'accès direct qu'elles ont obtenu auprès de nos élus et de nos institutions politiques. This story feels familiar to us in New Brunswick as well. Um, as an example, over 35,000 New Brunswickers have signed a petition to stop spraying glyphosate um, from the air onto New Brunswick forests. This is the largest petition in New Brunswick history. De simples calculs rapides démontrent que cela représente 7% de la population adulte néo brunswickoise dans son ensemble. And yet, those 35,000 voices carry less weight than a few powerful corporate voices. This isn't right. We ran on a platform that promised a green government would strengthen the Lobbying Act to require greater transparency. We're short a few MPs to be drafting government bills. However, I'm committed as the MP for Fredericton to do my part on this issue. Um, and as the MP for Fredericton, I commit to creating spaces and opportunities for citizens to bring their concerns to me directly, and I commit to listening. Dans ma circonscription, nous avons fixé des heures de bureau dans des espaces communautaires où les gens se sentent à l'aise de venir vous rencontrer et de nous partager leurs enjeux qui affectent leur vie et de tous les jours. We hosted a series of town halls um, in the Fredericton area to connect directly with hundreds of constituents in their, every corner of the riding, and I commit to holding government accountable where I see undue corporate influence, as my colleagues and I have done here today. Thank you. Merci. Mouliwen. Miigwech. Alors, petit résumé en français, parce que nous sommes ici, parce que nous avons une grande inquiétude au sujet du pouvoir des entreprises, les grandes entreprises, et particulièrement les grandes entreprises multinationales, au sujet de la réglementation de leur industrie. Nous trouvons que les organismes de réglementation s'en remettent de plus en plus à l'industrie qu'ils réglementent. I suppose it sums up for me the moment I became aware of this. It's been going on for decades, but I think it's getting worse. The moment that Dr. Shiv Chopra, who was uh, working on the threat to human health of hormones in meat, uh, was told by his supervisor at Health Canada uh, when he said, but the public interest requires that we warn people that the, that the cows that are getting this hormone are, are becoming ill, they get cancers. And the, his supervisor said, we're not interested in cows getting cancer. That's not our problem. And he said, but, but we work for the Canadian people. And he said, no. Look, Monsanto's, his boss said, Monsanto's our client. I don't see the Canadian public sitting outside in that lobby. So we really do need to shine a light on this. Et l'affaire SNC-Lavalin a mis en lumière l'ampleur d'influence qu'ils peuvent exercer uh, le, les grandes sociétés. Et avec la, le moment, avec en lumière, on doit avoir plus. Une enquête au sujet de la SNC-Lavalin et leur influence. Une enquête au sujet de qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour réduire l'influence des grandes sociétés sur les questions de la réglementation de leur propre activité. So we're open to any questions you might have. It's a broad, <laughs> cross-cutting question. Yes. Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm specifically interested in uh, the problem as we see it related to uh, Canada's uh, lobbying, mm -hmm. lobbying regulations. Do you have any proposed solutions when it comes to that for the problem as you see it? The problem as we see it is that uh, we, at this point, uh, the watchdog for lobbyists is not uh, sufficiently independent or sufficiently resourced. Um, I, you know, I, I put in a lobbyist complaint um, how many years ago now? I'm still waiting for a response. I know they're looking into it because it finally was, this was on the question of whether Marineland had registered as a lobbyist on the question of the bill that is now law to prevent the keeping of whales in captivity. But the complaint that went to the lobbyist registry was at least 
three years ago now. Uh, they then did pass it on as a complaint for the RCMP to investigate. But we see this as a problem of resourcing and a lack of independence for the watch. The, registra the registrar of lobbyists could use more resources and more independence because at the moment, at le and, and this is the view of Democracy Watch, which is the only NGO that is dedicated to um, tracking uh, influence of lobbyists, influence of big banks, and so on. Their view is that the registrar for lobbyists is controlled by cabinet. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but the reality of it is it's definitely lacking in independence and lacking in resources to track the activity of lobbyists. And do you want to add anything about lobbyists? Okay. That's okay. So just to sum up, so then uh, your preferred solution in that area would, would be a more independent office and, and more resources for the office? Is there anything That's else? That's correct. And I think in relation to lobbyists as well, this is related to the issue of, of whistleblowers. We don't have whistleblower legislation protection. I, I told the anecdote of the late Dr. Shiv Chopra. Um, he, in the, in, the, in the end, was subpoenaed by a Senate inquiry that allowed him to testify to the threat of this particular uh, growth hormone. Uh, in the end, he didn't uh, remain at Health Canada. He was he was fired. There is whistleblowers in this country need to be protected. So you have the corporate lobbyist influence, and where you have someone within a department that says, "I see a problem here. I don't like the extent of the the way this decision is going." So if if the lobbyists are getting too much power, you need a counter. Well, number one, lobbyists shouldn't have that kind of power. But the whistleblowers are essential. And they're not protected in this country. So we've been waiting for good whistleblower legislation for a very long time. And we are going to continue to push for it in this parliament. Uh, Minister Wilkinson was pushed about, make, uh, about what decision the cabinet's going to make on tech, my oil sands mine in Alberta. Yeah. Uh, he, of course, was cagey and said, well, we'll make that decision at the end of February. Are you suggesting that maybe it's a fait accompli because lobbyists and corporate influence have already been in there uh, swaying how cabinet will decide on that yeah. particular mine? It's an excellent question. I asked, I asked Minister Wilkinson about Tech Frontier yesterday in question period, and his response was, as you say, this is, this is going through the environmental review process. Uh, of course, it's gone through the environmental review process under the previous law, CIA 2012. Uh, I have, by the way, I think the current environmental assessment law is also far too weak and still follows Harper's architecture for environmental assessment. But the... Um, the point that we included a quote at the end of this press release from Kevin Taft, former leader of the Alberta Liberal Party, whose book Oil's Deep State is subtitled How the Petroleum Industry Undermines Democracy and Stops Action on Global Warming in Ottawa and Alberta. The reality is that there's a foregone conclusion before you even begin that oil and gas projects are going to be approved. It's, it's difficult to... Um, overturn the existing presumption in favor of approval of large oil and gas mega projects. In this case, the Environmental Assessment Panel has already reported that there will be massive environmental damage that cannot be rectified. You cannot um, mitigate the environmental damage of the Tech Frontier oil sands mine. And that's not even including the climate component, which the Environmental Panel didn't study. Even with that, the Environmental Assessment Panel took it on itself to say, but the economic benefits outweigh this environmental damage. And if you, if you, if you pull a little bit below the surface on that, say, what assumptions did they make about the economics of producing raw bitumen? And it's very easy to see that the assumptions are out of whack with the current market, out of whack with current reality. So we have a, a deep and, and what Kevin Taft has called a deep state bias in favor of oil and gas, which prejudices and undermines action on climate change. Another way Kevin Taft put it that I thought was very powerful was when, was when um, Rachel Notley became premier. He said, Rachel Notley may be in office, but the oil industry is still in power. That's the nature of political change versus the deep commitment to a particular industry from the people who are supposed to regulate it undermine the uh, concept of free prior informed consent when you're supposed to be uh, consulting First Nations about these projects? Absolutely. Free prior and informed consent, the emphasis must be on prior. We're seeing time and time again, whether Site C or Muskrat Falls or uh, the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline, that the uh, so-called consent 
that is uh, granted is often coerced after a decision is made and various First Nations end up feeling, well, we really don't have a choice here and we need the money from a benefit agreement. What should we do? I was talking recently with a First Nations leader in my own community and um, I'm not even going to use the gender because I don't have permission to mention who this person was, but, but they said, look, we're, we have uh, Kinder Morgan, Trans Mountain, bombarding, that's the word used, bombarding our First Nation with offers of millions and millions of dollars to abandon our principles and go along with the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Now, that particular First Nation is not about to abandon their principles and is holding firm. But I find it very offensive to know that our tax dollars, because Trans Mountain is no longer a private sector operation, this is the government of Canada bombarding First Nations that are defending their rights and wanting to protect their ancestral rights to healthy waters, to the Salish Sea, for fishing and continuing to protect and live in, in harmony with the, as much as we can these days. This is, these are strong First Nations rights protected by the Douglas Treaty, and our own government is using millions of dollars to try to change the view of that First Nation. Uh, that can't be called free prior informed consent. That's a combination of coercion and bribery. Several short questions, if I can. Uh, Ms. May, you mentioned the Senate, it's often been a source of grievance for members of Parliament who have seen private bills die in the Senate mm -hmm. when there was conflicts of interest. The chair of the Legal uh, Constitutional Affairs Committee was a paid consultant for Power Corporation to the day he retired. Chair of the Budget Committee was a director of a federally regulated company. There was a Nova senator from Nova Scotia last year who was literally a director of a company applying for. NDRIP grants while he voted on the Department of Industry's budget. So you know that the uh, Cabinet is going to introduce an amendment to the Parliament of Canada Act regarding the Senate because they want to strip the official opposition Conservatives of funding. You have enough MPs to propose an amendment. Will you propose an amendment that the same rules of conflict and disclosure that apply to members of Parliament apply to Senators? Absolutely. Tell me about why that's so important in the 21st century. And, and this was actually an issue that Paul raised, so I don't know if you want to speak to it directly, but I'll just say that conflict of interest rules, and again, I, I want to go back to we really need to change statute law, which embeds conflict of interest as a goal for certain regulators to both promote the industry they regulate it while they regulate it. These laws need to change. In the context of how we perform our duty, as parliamentarians, whether we're elected members of parliament or senators, we must not operate where we have a personal conflict, where there is a pecuniary personal benefit to an individual senator or an individual MP when making decisions which we are sworn to do solely with the good of Canada in mind. It's, it's a shocking thing to me that the conflict of interest guidelines for senators remain so weak. Whether there's a benefit or not, you have staff and members of parliament who have to disclose hockey tickets and directorships at daycare centers. Mm -hmm. Is there an assumption that being a senator is a full-time job and you have no business serving as a director of any corporation that has business with the government of Canada? I would think most Canadians would be shocked when they realize that the current situation is that people working with senators are not considered, and the senator itself is not considered a full-time job, and that you can also maintain interests, business dealings that are inconsistent with your obligations to serve only the interests of Canada. I want to ask two other questions to your associates. Uh, Ms. Atwin. The party was quite emphatic after the election. No way, no how would uh, they vote on a confidence motion without a clear declaration of a stronger uh, climate change program. But you voted for C2. <clears throat> mm -hmm. What? So last evening I voted non-confidence in the speech from the throne, which is actually what we kind of dedicated ourselves against. But for this, the supplementary budget estimates, I did um, vote in favor of the government to keep things running. So it was really about me allowing the departments to have the resources that they need to reach the end of the fiscal year. So it was more about, you know, ensuring that we give them the tools that they need. Um, but really, speech from the throne, we all had our, our time yesterday as well to say why. Um, that's when I voted non-confidence. So you understand my <clears throat> confusion? 
Yes, yeah. So I know, I mean, we stood here as well and we talked about um, Clinic 554 as an example and having that being in the throne speech and being the reason um, for me in particular. Can you speak to I'm asking about? Don't care about the throne speech. Okay. That was a confidence bill. Mm -hmm. You voted for it. I did. It was going to pass anyway. Yep. Yep. For me, it was just showing that I'm willing to work and be collaborative um, and allowing them to have the tools that they needed to finish out the fiscal year. Mr. Manley, I wanted to ask you, you had an unusual news release on the 20th about a carbon tax exemption for grain drying. I didn't want to ask you about the exemption because you explain it, but you understand my confusion. The planet is burning, the children are dying, civilization, yep. existential threat, Absolutely. World War II analogy, unless I'm drying grain in Yorkton, in which case I get an exemption. Do you understand why? There, I understand consistency is the refuge of small mines, but, it, but it, it's confusing. Can you explain that? Well, there are exemptions already in the carbon tax for, for farmers, for things like tractors and uh, other equipment. And because farmers are really at the, at the mercy of the vagaries of, of uh, weather and the climate, they are, are heavily affected by climate change right now, um, we thought that they, they deserved a break for this year. Yeah. And so it's not a permanent thing. And what we, we've asked for is that the technology, that, that the government put money into technology so the drain, grain uh, drying can be done in, with renewable energy, with uh, renewable sources, and also to look at uh, shorter-term uh, grain harvest, so, you know, hybrid uh, plants for different grains because the climate is changing and uh, it, is, it is affecting farmers, and so we thought that that was important to stand with farmers so on that issue. Have been some, aside from lobbying by farmers, speaking of lobbying, mm -hmm. you would have had in your mind some criteria that would determine who would get an ad hoc new exemption from the carbon tax and who would not. Because I can hear a mom and pop trucking company in Yorkton saying, I'd like to get some of that too. This carbon tax is really killing our business. Mm -hmm. What was that criteria? Yeah, sure. I th one of the things I would say about the carbon tax, especially in British Columbia, is you can, f you can fly in a jet fresh pineapple and there's no carbon tax on the, on the jet fuel for that pineapple but if you truck in if you do truck in produce from out of town you know from the farms to the, the farmers market you're paying carbon tax on that fuel so there are inconsistencies with with our our carbon tax and because of international trade rules we can't we can't put a carbon tax on that jet fresh pine pineapple you're not really answering my question my question was you proposed a temporary yeah. special ad hoc yeah. exemption well it's your news release Mr. Well, it, no it's a party news release it came from all of us so what was the the criteria is related to what we saw was an oversight, not a new exemption. Clearly, the government intended to exempt farmers from the carbon tax. They exempted fuel used on farm, tractors and so on. But, but that wasn't – the delivery is still – what we're talking about here is that this was the harvest from hell. I think the government of Canada did not – was not aware that the carbon tax was going to apply to an activity that is not that common in farming, that you have to dry the grain. And that grain drying is directly the result of carbon emissions that have led to a climate emergency, which is why the grain was wet. This is not normal. This is not normal procedure. It doesn't happen every year. And what we looked at was we thought there has been a mistake here in the way the government applied an intended exemption for farmers. Now, we will not be uh, – uh, we're nothing if not consistent. We want to make sure that Canada adopts a target in 2020. We are required by the Paris Agreement this year to remove the old Harper target, which is far too weak. It has to at least be doubled if this government is at all serious. And we've always said a carbon tax is a minor part of an overall strategy. I understand that. Yeah. Uh, did the Department of Agriculture tell you it was an oversight? Did they tell you they meant to include grain drying? Well, it wouldn't have been the Department of Agriculture. It would have been the Department of Environment. This is my – our reading of the way that the carbon tax was being applied was that they – no, but they intended clearly to exempt farmers and fuel used on farm. And grain drying fell outside of that, and it's a very well, large impact for them. Name. So my last question is very straightforward. So mm -hmm. It sounds like a pretty subjective criteria. Well, it's our criteria. Criterion. Right. It, it so, so it sounds pretty subjective. I, I, I don't see it codified or any sort of text for that. 
So there will be people who will say, that's great. Mm -hmm. So Grain Dryer in York gets an exemption, and I get to pay that. But no one asked me in the Green Party or the Department of Environment about my ability to carry that charge. I pay for me, mm -hmm. and I pay for them. How fair is that? The carbon tax must apply economy-wide, society-wide. The fact of the matter is that there was an exemption for agriculture because we know that the agricultural sector operates at very, very slim margins of being able to survive, and the farming community needs to be engaged as active participants through soil regenerative policies as part of the climate solution. This seemed to us, and I'm sorry if you see, to think it's subjective, uh, to be an oversight in a decision that was already made to exempt agriculture from the carbon tax on fuels. We do need to make sure, as Paul said, that grain drying can be provided by renewable sources, and of course it can. We also know that if you're driving a truck, you have immediate solutions to avoid having having to pay carbon tax by moving to biofuels. They are available. They work in vehicles. There are ways in which the price signal on fuel for truckers, the price signal on fuel for, for uh, passenger vehicles, there are choices that you can make that reduce the carbon tax by re either reducing how much diesel you're burning, uh, you can attach a, a hydrogen transformer to the side of your vehicle, that's then called Empire Hydrogen. Each unit is about $10,000, but it will substantially reduce how much diesel you're burning. In other words, for almost every application you can imagine, there is a viable replacement that reduces your carbon. For the farmers with wet grain, this year there was not such a, a, a technological alternative for them. So it also, on a number of, in a number of ways, it differentiates itself from the other examples you've put forward. I wanted to know if your caucus supports a swift passing of the new NAFTA, and I'd like to hear from Ms. Atwood. Bye. Uh, about uh, the new NAFTA impact on New Brunswick and specifically. Just to say that the caucus, we've, we've, we're working through how we make decisions, and tomorrow we're having our review of the new NAFTA. Paul is the party trade critic, uh, and I'm, I'm – so we could give – we could tell you – I'm certainly – uh, we want to follow through on our process of giving each other an opportunity to think through whether we have consensus as a group on the new version. I have to say it's a very positive thing that the newly negotiated NAFTA removes the energy chapter and removes Chapter 11 in the investor state provisions. Um, and I'll ask Paul if he wants to speak in general to this and then let Jenica make any comments she wants. We're still, in other words, we're in process and we'll know once we finish our final discussion meeting tomorrow. So I think in terms of this version of NAFTA versus the old version of NAFTA, this is a much improved document. So as Elizabeth said, removing investor state dispute settlement provisions, which uh, we've paid out hundreds of millions of dollars, taxpayer money to corporations when laws and policies get in the way of their profitability. Um, the proportionality clause, which says that we have to con continue to export the same amount of energy to the United States as we have in the last three years, the same proportion. Uh, we're happy to see that uh, the, the uh, patents on biologic drugs has been left where it is at eight years instead of extending it to 10 years. We're happy to see that uh, there's labor standards that are with teeth in them for uh, Mexico. So, you know, they, they have the right for, to collective bargaining. And if there are uh, issues around labor um, that, that are brought forward, it's not, they don't have to be uh, continual issues. It can be one-off issues that uh, um, sanctions could be levied on. So there's a number of things. We're, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the um, regulatory harmonization part of, of NAFTA and how that unfolds. As I mentioned earlier on, we've seen uh, this kind of situation before with the Security and Prosperity Partnership where, you know, a group of corporations are determining what our regulation, uh, regulatory standards are going to be between Canada, the United States and Mexico. And we want to see regulations, uh, you know, th where the, the bar is raised. We want to look at more of a European model where countries that join the European Union have to bring their standards up to meet the, the standards of the other countries. So there's, there's pluses and minuses in it. There's, there are some pluses on the environmental front, but they, the um, uh, climate change isn't a, a key part of it. We're, we're seeing that multilateral agreements 
um, like Species at Risk Act are, are going to have precedence in this, but we don't see anything uh, under climate change, and I, I don't think that there's enough teeth under the environmental provisions. Is it a better agreement? By far, yeah. Jennifer, did you want to comment on your um, <clears throat> Yeah, so just I wanted to mention that some of the discussion points that I'll be focusing on are particularly about softwood lumber and how it affects New Brunswick. Um, prescription drugs as well, that's been raised quite a bit. We're talking about pharmacare and what that's going to look like in, in Canada, but also there is a concern about um, pharmaceuticals kind of crossing the border and, um, you know, cheaper rates for the United States to come here and, and purchase it. So that's something that I have some questions about. I do want to acknowledge um, that Christian Freeland was very, you know, nice and, and collaborative and to offer us an individual uh, personal briefings, which was really nice to see. So um, I think that's, that's a good sign about where our government is headed. On Softwood in particular, Premier Blaine Higgs says he's been told by Ms. Freeland that this new NAFTA needs to be squared away before, I guess, a full push can be made on a new Softwood deal. Have you heard the same thing? Uh, and will that influence your vote in order to get this squared away to focus on Softwood? Mm. I mean, I've, I've heard discussions about the softwood. Uh, Premier Higgs and I have had a meeting, but that didn't actually come up in our discussions at that time. Um, so, no, to answer your question, um, but we'll certainly have lots to, to discuss tomorrow, and I'll have a, a better answer for you. Um, and one other one. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of Maritime Iron and their submission, the EIA in New Brunswick. Um, it explicitly says in the EIA that they'll add more than a million tons of CO2 per year to the yeah. province. Um, they are planning to, in hopes to keep a coal plant, fire plant open in, Bel in Baldoon open, lower its emissions. They want um, their global scope to be, I guess, taken into account, to their change to shipping traffic and, and things like that. Do you buy that case and do you support this business being created, um, despite potentially torpedoing you know, New Brunswick's own 2030 targets. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I don't buy the approach that it's going to have this this massive reduction on, on a global, global scale. We really need to focus on our own backyards, what's happening in our own province, and to contribute in that way to such an increase of emissions and to continue coal in Beldoon is just not the direction that, that I would be willing to support. So we did discuss that um, during our meeting, um, and so there's there will be further discussions uh, because we're, we're not on the same page right now on, on where we should go with Maritime Iron. You're meeting with uh, Premier Higgs. If I could just add, I mean, uh, the, one of the overarching pieces to our press release today on the nature of corporate influence and the, the, the extent to which, at a deep level, government is influenced by various industries, I think the two biggest uh, really are, well, it's hard to leave out SNC-Lavalin, but as sectors, the fossil fuel lobby and the pharmaceutical lobby have a, a level of influence over government decision making that is scandalous. So when you're looking at, at, at continual efforts to increase greenhouse gases, whether it's LNG Canada, which claims it's going to create 10,000 jobs with all the subsidies it's getting from the federal government and, and, and tariff exemptions for aluminum and steel, they don't mention of the 10,000 jobs, 5,500 of them are on, on mainland China. You know, that, so we are being told that we should accept uh, a 6 million ton increase in greenhouse gases, we should be prepared to accept that because Tech Frontier, you can't say no to Tech Frontier, well, and you can't say no to maritime iron. We have to recognize that if we have any hope at all of sustaining human civilization through the lifetime of our children, not just in Canada, but globally, we have to say no to any new fossil fuel projects. So it's the first rule of holes, as Bill McGibbon says, if you're in one, stop digging. So we will be resolute as Greens against proposals that increase greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. That is just, and we will promote those new technologies that use atmospheric CO2 to produce useful products. We're not looking enough in this country at our potential once we go to a carbon neutral economy, a post-carbon economy. What does that look like? Where are the new jobs? Where are the new technologies? And there are many. We should stop investing in the sunset industries and shift our focus to what Canada looks like by 2030 when we start having concrete that sucks carbon out of the atmosphere, when we start having abandoned oil wells converted to geothermal green electricity, when we stop assuming that we can uh, keep consulting with indigenous people until we force them to say yes to something that, with 
free, prior, and informed consent, they would have rejected. The, this is a, a, a large shift in direction, and it really requires that the government of Canada and provinces stop assuming that the economic interests of whatever group is at their door lobbying count for more than human health, uh, our climate future, uh, public safety on aircraft, whatever area of society you examine. And I tell you, air traffic control is another area that really worries me. Right across the board, industry and its profitability is outranking the public interest, and it's a very serious problem. It's right across every department, and we hope that in this parliament we'll be able to, to bring it to light and propose more solutions. And I think our time is just about expired, but if there are any more questions, we'll be remaining available outside. Merci beaucoup.